in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It happened in a moment, an explosion of light from heaven and a symphony of angels. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of the everyday. Eternity stepped into time. God became man. God entered the world. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Forgiveness for the sinner. Grace to the humble. His kingdom will never end. His name is Jesus. Okay, we're, we're talking about today about Jesus and the virgin birth. And many of you grew up in the church or grew up in our culture. Uh, many of you grew up Catholic or Presbyterian, or perhaps you didn't grow up in any church at all. Perhaps some of you that we have in our church group, Muslim or an atheist or Hindu. And you're wondering, what's the, what's the story about the virgin birth? What's the big deal about the virgin birth? And frankly, did it even happen and how did it happen? Well, today I want to look at that today. It's important to understand that because the, uh, what happened with the virgin birth affects our relationship with Christ. And it's an amazing thing how God became flesh and dwelt among us. It, it actually has caused great problems through people through the millennia and millennia. So it, is the fact that people have a hard time reconciling that a perfect God of all power and all grace would become one of us. Now you're thinking, what's the big deal about it? Well, the big deal about it is this. When we understand what Jesus is and what he did for us, it gives us greater confidence to enter God's presence with assurance. And it also helps us to remind ourselves what Christmas is all about. I believe that knowledge is power. And uh, the Bible says my people are, are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. And there's a lot of challenges today dealing with Jesus, existence of Christ. Well, it was all made up. It's fictitious. It was just a girl that got pregnant and things of that nature. And uh, there's no such thing as a virgin birth. But it's interesting. I read a, a survey that was about seven years old now. It says that 73% 73, 73 of U.S. citizens believe in the virgin birth, which I found quite extraordinary. So we're going to look at it today and see what the significance of that is. And he entered the word through that. Now, there's been another problem I've seen happen. I've seen the deification of Mary. In other words, where people make Mary, the mother of Jesus, almost a godlike figure, where there's great reverence um, given to her, statues made of her, and maybe some of you grew up Catholic and things of that nature. This is not a Catholic bashing session at all. We're going to look at the Word of God. We're not into doing stuff like that. And then there's also, in the Protestant, uh, which would be people that are not Catholic, that believe in Christ and don't follow the, the Pope or what have you, we call them Protestants, which I'm not a big fan of that word because it means protester. Uh, but really, we're, at this church, we have all sorts of folks coming, and we believe the Word of God is our final authority. We actually believe this is the Word of God. We live by it. And we, we appreciate church history. It's a good reference point. But our fulcrum or our plumb line or our standard of measurement comes always back to here because it's easy for culture to begin to shape us. And even, I would venture to say, unfortunately, uh, 100 years from now, if the Lord doesn't return, or even 50 years from now, people are going to look back in 2016 and said, man, how could they be so blind about this? It's so obvious in Scripture. Truth is, you and I have blind spots. And that's why it's so important, as much as we appreciate culture, as much as we appreciate tradition, we must always go back to here and look at the Bible as if it was the first time we read it, to make sure we're on the right path, or we can get way off. 
But it's so exciting when you find out what Christ did. It, it, it actually, we were, men were having a discussion this Wednesday. We talked about Jesus being totally God and totally flesh, and it's offensive. It's offensive how God could be like us, and God could use a latrine. <laughs> God could sleep. God could get up, you know, get tired and hungry and thirsty. That doesn't just seem right. How could God do that? And so there seems to be the deification of, uh, of Mary, or Mary's no big deal. We don't even care about her, and we totally don't look at her, and she is the only person in history that had a virgin birth. That is very, very significant. And Mary is an amazing, amazing a prototype of what we should be like in regards to her heart, her receptivity to what God did in her life. Extraordinary. And there should be um, homage, if you will, not homage, but there should be credit and there should be uh, a standard of high, high standard. We talk about the Apostle Paul a lot of times. Well, I think Mary is someone we should really esteem. And I think what it also does, it esteems women around the world, which is absolutely amazing. And this is a little side note. That often uh, the church is, is criticized for holding down women. Uh, nothing could be further than the truth. The Bible, including the Old Testament, is the greatest women liberation that has ever transpired in the history of the planet. More credence and more value is given to women in Christianity than any other political or religious system around the world. It's absolutely amazing. And the fact that God chose a woman to come to the earth. He didn't come through some spaceship. <laughs> he didn't come by appearing. He didn't come in some great fashion that people would go, whoa, look at this. This is undeniable. He came down in a cloud. No, he came down in a very humble and ordinary and, yes, an offensive way. He didn't come in grandiose uh, fashion. He came in a manger. And my friends, a manger, we talk about how wonderful a manger is. It basically, a manger is a feeding trough. You ever smell a wet dog? Imagine a barn full of wet and stinky animals. And some cattle or donkeys or horse or whatever are eating out of this thing with slobber all over and what happens they put swaddling clothes you know what swaddling clothes are strips of cloth and people would often when they went on trips they would carry swaddling clothes with them because sometimes people would die on the trip if you found a dead body on the road it was another you're supposed to wrap it in cloth I mean, it's amazing as i'm reading about this and so what did jesus he was literally wrapped in grave clothes amazing, isn't it? It was like a foretaste of what was going to happen to him. The very animals that ate out of that trough could have very well been, maybe it was a lamb. And here he is feeding the final sacrifice. It's offensive that Jesus was born in such a way. It doesn't make any sense. If, if you and I were going to put a committee together, how God should come back, we would never vote on such a crazy thing. It would kick you off the, the heaven's board. What are you thinking? What? Why are you going to make God a baby? That's ridiculous. How come on a white horse? and He comes in such a fashion, in such a way. The question, why did, why did God do that for? Why did God come in such a way that, frankly, is offensive? Do you realize that, the first, that Christ came through a woman? You know who the first person that saw Christ when he rose again from the dead was? A woman. <laughs> what? You know how women were treated back in those days and what they were seen as? It just does not make any sense why you would make up a religion and choose such a ridiculous way to do it, which would offend thousands and thousands and millions of people around the world because it goes against the cultural norms of the day. And yet Jesus did this, an amazing thing. And what he does is, you know, God is always, he's not after our behavior. He's not after your money. He's not after sacrifice. He's not after religious shenanigans. I tell you what God is after. God is after our hearts. He will often offend the mind to reveal what's in the heart. Because really, lasting change does not come through uh, forced behavior. Lasting change comes when a heart is transformed. And out of that heart comes behavior that eventually finds itself in its hands. And God always goes for the core of the person because that's the most important. So we're going to look at some scriptures 
this morning and read quite a bit actually. But Christ entered the world through the virgin birth uh, is an amazing thing. Some argue that virgin birth is absolutely impossible. There's no way it can happen. Of course, today, uh, they could implant a seed in a woman's uterus. And so, technically speaking, I suppose, it, but back in those days, no such thing. There was no seed from a, another man. It was something that was half God and half human. He's called the Son of Man and the Son of God. He was fully human. The first Adam blew it. And, and so there had to be a perfection because in Adam's line there is sin. And so what God did, he chose a vehicle by the, probably a 13 or 14 year old girl married to a 30 year old man. That would get you arrested today. I am not suggesting for a moment that that is the right way to go. Okay, but that was the culture back in those days. And here you have Mary. So people say it's impossible. They contend Mary is neither the last or the first person to find herself in this trouble, but she was just a pregnant teenage girl that got herself into trouble. And believe me, when something like never, never in the history of man has there ever been a virgin birth, believe me, when she talked about that, can you imagine the ridicule she had? Can you imagine the embarrassment she had? It is extraordinary. Second belief is that um, miracles did happen, but it wasn't the virgin birth. Other folks believe it is in the Bible and it's true, but they don't understand the significance of it. And I hope today we're going to not only know it's true, but what is the significance of the virgin birth? From the very, very beginning, it said in the book of Genesis that she shall bruise your heel, her seed. And Jesus is the second Adam to make right what the first Adam did. You see, sin entered humanity through one man and through another man Humanity is made correct if it receives what God has done for it. And that's the miracle of Christmas. And so let's go ahead and look at it. Right now, Isaiah 7.14 says something extraordinary. It says, therefore, the Lord himself, the Lord himself, Yahweh himself, will give you a sign. What is the sign? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel is a nice word that basically means God with us. Doesn't mean that God's information's with us. It doesn't mean the inform it doesn't mean a, a, a government's with us. It means literally that God is with us. And then we come to John 1. And it says the following. I'm going to read a lot of scripture today. I hope that's okay. We like reading scripture in church, if that's okay for everybody. Uh, I encourage you to bring your Bibles or your tablets or, or even the actual paper. I miss the days when I used to hear people go like this. But anyhow, I'm dating myself. John 1, 1, 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, I want to stop you just for a moment. It says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, it's equating the word with God and was God and is God. Not a God, but God himself. And if you look in the Greek, it's undeniable that it actually says that Jesus is God. How can you tell if there's a cult or a false religion when they say that Jesus is not God? And I don't want to get into a debate right here this morning, but Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe this. They actually changed the Greek, and they're completely wrong. Jesus is and was. It's offensive, folks. It's offensive. It, it bothers people. How can that possibly be? How can flesh and spirit it doesn't coexist? Well, it does here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus, through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was a life, and the light, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We jump ahead. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children 
of God. In other words, there was a separation between God and man, and now, as a result of Jesus, we can become children of God. Even if you're orphaned, even if you don't know who your parents are, my dad did not know his parents. He was separated. Then he was 16, never heard anyone say, I love you, until he was 16 years old, and the first person he heard to say, I love you, was a supernatural experience when my dad heard Jesus say, David, I love you. And your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, you're, you are mine. That's what Jesus does. He actually creates a bridge between heaven and earth and brings us to the very place where God is. And so in him was life and life of men. Verse 10, he was in the world, the world made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, those who believe and receive his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full of truth. This is the apostle John writing. He's the only begotten son. So here we have extraordinary. We have God of the entire, you look up in the sky at night, the person that made all that, God the Father, actually became one of us. It's absolutely impossible for us to know God without God. It's absolutely impossible for us to have a relationship with God with our sin. But what happened? God gave us himself in the form of a man called Jesus. He was literally flesh and blood. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And so the word is logos, and logos means the word. And so really, if you really want to get to know Jesus, if you read the word of God, I just want a little side note. He's called the word, and if you want to get to know him, spend time in his word, because the whole Bible reveals Jesus Christ. It absolutely reviews and reveals Jesus Christ. In John 17, Jesus talks about the glory he enjoyed with the Father before the foundations of the earth. Philippians 2 talks about how he was God and, and, and lowered himself and became one of us and, and gave up all the rights and all the privileges of being God. In fact, uh, people say, well, how did Mary really become a virgin and, and have a child? I mean, what's the deal with that? And I've heard people say, you know, I heard people tell me, I think that Mary was Italian instead of Jewish. And I'm like, how, why is that? Well, because I'll tell you why we think that Jesus might have been Italian, because he lived at home until he was 30, <laughs> took over the family business, and his mother thought he was God. <laughs> I've used that for many years. I can't help myself. It's the first time you heard it laugh. If you heard it before, I still laugh. <laughs> and so I want to look at it and see what, what exactly happened. What happened through Jesus Christ? And it's important that we know. In Luke, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, says this. Now the sixth month, an angel Gabriel was sent to God in the city of Galilee named Nazareth. The sixth month, her, Elizabeth, her, her aunt, was pregnant with Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, which was another miracle because she was way past childbearing age. To a virgin, again, virgin, and the word virgin here means a virgin. People have tried to take, well, it means you're a young woman. No, it literally means virgin. A virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, which follows in that the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, if God says, Blessed are you among women, what does that mean? She's blessed among women. So we should give honor to what God honors. When you honor what God honors, you get the honor. When you honor God's authority, even in our government, this is a little side note, even if you don't like the government, God has allowed the government. If you honor the authority that's placed above you, God will honor you. You curse the authority that's above you, you're actually hurting yourself. Doesn't mean that we become subjected and we don't listen and we don't make any changes. But we have to honor the authority that God has given us. And what it says right here, it says, and to a virgin betrothed for man, and have come and said, rejoice, highly favored one, Blessed are you among women, for when she saw him, she was troubled. Can you imagine seeing an angel? I'd be a little troubled too. <laughs> troubled. Saying, and consider what manner of greeting this was. Well, that's kind of bizarre. You're sitting there, whatever she was doing, and just minding her own business. All of a sudden, an angel shows up. Behold, I'm highly favored of God. You know, that's kind of strange. 
But when she saw him, she was troubled, saying, Consider what manner of greeting this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You see, what happens is when God wants to introduce something new in our lives, the first response we normally have is fear. Because when, we, when you're dealing with God, he doesn't ask you to do something that you can do on your own. He asks you to take steps that are beyond the capacity that you have. Because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. So God will ask you to do things, give up things that you, think, think you don't think you can give up. Situations you don't think you can do. Investing in what you think don't work. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And I would say to you today, do not be afraid. Because when God is with you, what can touch us? And the answer, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. He shall be called named Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There'll be no end. Then Mary said to the angels, how can this be since I do not know a man? She's basically saying, I'm a virgin. How can this happen? Clearly, she was a virgin. If you believe in the word of God, you have to believe what the word of God says. She says she was a virgin. And the angel answered her and said to her the following, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who would be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age and is now in her sixth month of her who is called barren. I love this verse here, if you can learn this one. For with God, nothing will be impossible. The word impossible does not exist in God's dictionary. There's possibility with God, no matter what's going on. There's always possibility. Then Mary said, I love her, her, her response. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be According to your word. I wish we would all be able to do that. God, let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from him. So basically what happened was this. God came through Mary without knowing a man. He actually dropped some DNA that he actually made and mixed with her egg. And it became a fertilized egg. And Jesus, the son of God, grew in her womb. Isn't that amazing? And the first, Adam had sin and all kinds of problems. So the, basically, the, the, the genetics of it, was he absolutely flawless in every capacity? He, you know, we don't know the exact extent of it, but we do know this. Morally, he was flawless. He had the capacity to choose sin, but he did not sin. But he, he was born different than you and I. He didn't have a curse of Adam upon him because he didn't have Adam's seed. He had the seed from heaven. And it's kind of interesting, it's almost like uh, there's a halfway point between heaven and earth, and there's where Jesus is. Jesus, Jesus enters the planet in a way and a place where everyone can reach the access point of where he is. It's this area, uh, this landing place, where now you can go to heaven and know God. It's the halfway place between heaven and earth. And the beautiful thing is, you and I can get to Jesus, but we cannot get to God without Jesus. Amen. He's the halfway point. He's half God, half man. Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. So what he does, he has the, he has the genetics of humanity and the morality and grace of God, and the two meet together. It's the bridge, my friends. It's the actual bridge that God has made. Now, we continue to read, uh, imagine this, you know, I, we've heard it almost every year. There's a lot of excuses people give, especially teenagers. I'm pregnant. How? Well, the Holy Spirit impregnated me. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. My dog ate my homework, but you don't even have a dog. So here's Joseph, a godly man. Here another account, another gospel says this. Matthew 1.18. Now, the birth... Of Jesus Christ as his follow. After his mother Mary was betrothed, and betrothed means engaged, and back in those days, being engaged was pretty much like being married without all benefits. To Joseph, before they came together, and came together means before they had sexual intimacy. That's what it means. She was found with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example. Now he could have, as a man said, you know what? Stoner. 
And that's what would happen in those days. If a woman was found to be without child and even uh, betrothed, it, it could be the death sentence in the Jewish culture. Of course, the Romans didn't want them doing those things on their own, but they could find ways. And what did Joseph do? He's a just man. Not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. Not put her away in the way we think put away. Okay? Put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. See, the son of David. So you hear they have the genetics of mankind that's messed up, meeting the genetics of God, which is pure. He says, do not be afraid to take your Mary, your wife, for which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So all that was done, that might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophet, again, quoting the Old Testament, Isaiah, behold, a virgin shall be with child, and he will bear a son, they shall call him Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took to him his wife, Mary. And he did not know her, did not know her until she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Now, this is what's happened. We have the deification of, G of Mary, and we have people saying, ah, it's no big deal. Mary was a human being. Mary was an amazing human being, an amazing woman of God. God chose her as a vessel to bring Jesus Christ. But the clear the Bible indicates here, even in the Greek, that she knew Joseph after Jesus and they had other children. So what happens, unfortunately, in some church tradition, what they've done through ancestor, there used to be ancestor worship in the Roman culture, in the Greek culture. And, and they used to worship the goddess of Diane. And what they did is they began to syncretize some of the culture and some of the pagan practices, and it got found its way into a deification of Mary. Mary is not God. Mary carried God, but is not God. And so unfortunately, you do not find this in Scripture anywhere. That's why, my friends, it's so important that this has to be our standard of operation. Otherwise, we can get off in all kinds of tangents. And so it very clearly it says that in the Scripture. So it says he, didn't, she did, he did not know her until. He, they would have said he never knew her. But it says he did not know her until. And he called his name Jesus. Now Galatians says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the old law. Under the law. And what's the law? The law is there has to be death. There has to be a sacrificial lamb. So Jesus took the old covenant, the old way of doing things, where there, were, there was like a down payment. There was a layaway strategy. Basically, the sacrificial system was a layaway strategy. You could not complete the deal. You put some money down, but you couldn't pick it up at the redeem center until the final lamb came, and that's Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says very clearly here, um, it says right here very clearly, that Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What happens to people who don't know Jesus? I don't know, but they're gonna have to go through Jesus. Jesus is the halfway point between heaven and earth. He is the way we get to God. There is no way. It's like going to the airport and flying to Europe. You ha there's a halfway point, you have to get to the plane. Jesus is the vessel that takes us there. Impossible. You can drive to the airport, but you can't fly to Europe on your own. Can you? No. You'd have to take a plane or, well, if you're going to fly. And so the halfway point, the access point is the airport. Jesus is the access point. And the beautiful thing is, no matter who you are and what you've been through, you can get there. I'm the way and truth. So Mary is, 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 is special, but not deity. She was a vessel that was the halfway point. Now listen, verse, listen to this. In Mark 3, 32, just to bring clarification to this, this is what the Bible says. This is what we're doing. Look at the Bible. And the multitude was just later on when Jesus began his public ministry. He was teaching. He started gathering and amassing great crowds. And the multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Your mother and your brothers. Your mother and your brothers. He answered them, saying, Who is my mother? He didn't say, My mother. You better worship her or else. Now, I know some of you grow up in a culture where that's the case. <laughs> But Jesus said, look, he said, answer, who's your mother and brother? He said, he said, let me go back. I apologize. My eyes are not quite what they used to be. We're, we're asking God to heal them. Okay. Either that or I'll get bifocals. 
And the multitude was sitting around to him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them and said, Who is my mother? Who is my brothers? Okay, he's asking that. Who are they? He's like, Well, they're outside. Why are you asking who they are? Kind of a dumb question. Jesus often teaches through questions. And what does he say? He looked around a circle at those who sat around him. He said this, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my mother my brother and my sister. He puts Mary in her place. The fact is that what makes people mothers and brothers is the fact that we follow Jesus. And so he had reverence for his mother when he was on the cross. He looks at John and says, John, behold your mother. And Mary, behold your son. What happened to Joseph? We really don't know what happened to Joseph. Which, which is an interesting speculation. What happened to Joseph? Did he die? And if he died, how come Jesus didn't raise him up? That will be next week. We're going to answer that question and give document documentation and uh, archaeological evidence for that. I'm just kidding. That's not going to happen. All right. <laughs> but it's interesting. Is it not interesting that that is the case? Where's Joseph? We don't know where Joseph is later on. But Jesus clearly loved his mother, took care of his mother, did the right thing as a good Jewish boy, did. But at the same time, he didn't, he, didn't say, he didn't say she's God. He says, who's my mother and brothers? He who follows, follows me. Now, very interesting, later on in Scripture, it says in Peter, it says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God who's called you out of darkness and called you to the light. And so what the amazing thing is this is that he who follows me becomes me. Kingdom of priest. So no longer do we have this, uh, this, this system where there's this person we have to worship that's human. Now we are all kingdom of priests who directly to God because of what Christ did for us. And he's laying the groundwork right here saying, behold my mothers and brothers. Now this is not some obscure scripture. We also found in, in Matthew uh, 12, 47, it says the following. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers, a parallel passage, are standing outside seeking to speak with you in Matthew 12, 47. But he answered it and said to them, who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He stretched out his hand towards his disciples. Jesus stretched out his hands across the cross to the whole world. He who believes and follows me, they're my mothers, they're my brothers, they become my children. I am the access point. He stretched out his hands. He stretched out his, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and sister and brother. In Mark chapter uh, 6, verse 3, it says the following. Is this not the carpenter? When they're like, who's this guy? Jesus. He, he lived in the, in the community for a long time. He worked at the carpenter shop and with his dad and he was, uh, doing stone and making it. Actually, we're actually using his kitchen table. <laughs> and who, who, what do you mean he's the son of God? What's the deal with that? And so they said, is this not the carpenter? Mark 6, 3. The son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Why? How could God be so human? That's offensive. That's offensive. How could God be human? It's an offense. And by the way, you want to offend people today, all you have to do is mention Jesus. And you will offend people. There's something supernatural about the name of Christ. When you show the light, people don't like the light because it exposes the darkness. You know you're in the truth when you talk about Jesus and immediately there is a reaction against it. It's supernatural persecution. That's what it is. So, and we see in John 2, 5, I love what his mother said. You know what his mother tells us to do? What does Mary say to us today in this Christmas season? What does she want us to do? I'll tell you what she says. But the mother told the servants, if Mary could speak today, which she is, by the way, through the scriptures, she says, do whatever he tells you. That is the beauty of the mother of Jesus, Mary. Do what he tells you. She does not say, come through me. We don't have to pray to Mary. We don't need, Jesus is the intermediator. No one comes to the Father except through me. It doesn't say through Mary, Joseph, and all the saints. And all. No, it doesn't say that. It says through 
Jesus. Well, what about people who pray the same? That's up to God. But what I'm trying to tell us this morning, the beauty of Christmas is how God became man and dwelt among us. I'm going to ask if the worship team would get themselves ready at this time, please. And so I'm going to go back again and, and, and read to us uh, John 1, 10 through 14. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own received him not, did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were not born of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold this glory of the only begotten of the, full, of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the miracle of Christmas can happen here today. Now, some of you are saying, well, I'm already a believer, and so... You know, this is like beyond me. This is so elementary. But I appreciate all those other people that need to hear. No, uh, let me tell you something. This is not just for folks who don't know Christ yet. This is for all of us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. My friends, is God dwelling among you? How does God dwell among you? When His Word becomes flesh. Well, how does His Word become flesh? What does Jesus say? This is my what? Which has been broken for you. Take. Eat. We're supposed to be eating the blood of, and body of Christ. Ingesting of who he is. Now, is it literally eating his body? No. But when it says ingesting it, he's not asking us to know about him. Jesus is not a great moral teacher. He's not an entertainer. No, he is the bridge between mankind and God himself. He doesn't ask us just to follow him and just read about it. He asks us to ingest him. This is my body, which has been broken for take. You eat. So my, my encouragement to you today is to get into the word, eat the word. We don't read the Bible to know about God. We read the Bible to know God. And for those of you that are believers already, if you want more of the transformation of God dwelling among us to a greater capacity, we have to get more of his flesh in us and get rid of our flesh. And the beautiful thing is this. Rather than try to stop doing all these bad things, it's very frustrating. Have anyone ever tried to stop doing something? It's very frustrating, isn't it? Very frustrating. Because when you try to stop doing something, you're focusing on the thing you're not trying to do. And whatever you look at, you drive towards. It's so frustrating. That's why you fail. Don't try to, don't try to stop doing something. It doesn't work. I've tried it. But when I fill myself with God, the power to turn away from it becomes mine through Christ Jesus. And so instead of trying to change all these things and feel bad about yourself, you're no good, God says, listen, I'm the halfway point. Of course you can't, you cannot merit God's favor by trying harder. You can't save yourself and you can't be good enough to keep yourself well. You see, whether you believe in Christ and are saved or you have no belief in Christ, the only way we can live this life is by eating the body of Jesus. The only way we can eat the body is by reading and this word becoming flesh, which we'll talk about Christmas Eve, and dwelling among us. Happens in a relationship with God. Jesus saves you, and he gives you the power and the ability to walk the life he has for you. Through him, I can do through great effort, I can do all things. Through coming to church every time the doors are open, I can, by reading the Word of God and memorizing Scripture. He doesn't say that. What does it say? Through what? Christ. Through Christ. Not through yourselves. So this Christmas, 
as we reach a new year and as we say, and some of you are like, I don't want to deal with trying to change anymore. The beautiful thing is that God transformed the history of the planet AD and uh, BC and AD. And they're trying to change it now. What happened? He's the halfway point. He's the access point to God. And anyone and everyone can get there. That's the beautiful thing of it. He is the bridge. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Not just for salvation, but for all of us to become what God has called us to become. You see, we have to stop trying to be somebody and, and start knowing Christ. It's by knowing we are growing. It's by knowing Christ we are growing. And the knowing is not here, it's here. But you need this to get it to here. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I want to know nothing else but Jesus Christ. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. This is a man that had it all together. This is a man that memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. He studied at the greatest university, Gamaliel, who was a tremendous teacher. He knew it all. He said, all that I count as C-R-A-P. I'm not going to say it in church. He says, I count it as dung compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus. Forgetting what lies behind, I press onward to the higher mark of Jesus Christ. And, and the whole connotation of that is not getting more information here. It's getting to know Christ. And so whether you have been a believer for 10 minutes or you're not a believer yet, you want to become what God's called you to become? It's through Jesus Christ. He is the bridge. He is the way. He is the truth. He's the way for your marriage. He's the way for your finances. He's the way for your health. He's the way for America. He's the way for Cheshire, Southbury, Middlebury, whatever Barry you live in. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. The, the story of Christmas is Christ becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Are you dwelling in Him? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the beauty, the majesty, the incredible spiritual poetry, beautiful poetry of that, of how all history rhymes and it only rhymes through the name of Jesus Christ where everything fits together and holds together we know it says in the scripture God that the spirit of Christ holds the universe together father I pray in Jesus name right now for those that are watching us live or later or those in here right now we thank you that you hold together families I pray for fractured families right now that that call on your name and know you I pray for marriages that are in trouble I pray for parents and children that are separated. We thank you that the Spirit of Christ holds the universe. It holds our families together. It holds the finances together. It will hold this church together. It will hold this nation together. Father, we want to know nothing else but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because, Father, you are the way. You are the truth. You're the way between heaven and earth. You are the only bridge. And Father, we forgive us for trying to do the old way trying to be good enough and say enough and read enough and pray enough and go to church enough and father it isn't about that is it lord it's all about knowing you it's knowing you for father in jesus name i pray for those right here this morning that already have given their lives to you they've done it already but they don't really spend time with you anymore and so they kind of lost the intimacy father i pray i thank you there's no condemnation for those in christ jesus you're just saying come so, Lord, I pray that you would draw people to you. Lord, as we leave here today, as we see the Bibles outside and, and as we have our own Bibles, that we recognize the fact that we want to know you through your word and through your body, which is the church. Father, I pray that Cornerstone Church in 2016 would not just read the Bible, but they would know Jesus by spending time with Jesus, which is his word and his body, which is the church. In Jesus' name. Now, with every head bowed, I'm going to ask you another question. Do you actually know God? You cannot get to heaven or get to God by any other way than Jesus Christ. Not Buddha, not Hinduism, not even Judaism, by the way. The only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. And some of you, you're trying to figure it out, you can't figure it out. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door. And I knock. 
if anyone opens the door, behold, I will eat and sup with them. I will accept you. He didn't say the perfect. He doesn't say the sa He says if anyone opens the door. And I believe if you're here today or watching or hearing this, I believe that God is waiting and knocking at your door. He loves you. He wants you. He's got a great plan for your life. Not just here now, but forever. And so today could be a day. The greatest Christmas gift, you get to open a little early before Christmas, is to give your life to Jesus. So with every head bowed, we're going to pray right now. Pray quietly in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you were born of the Virgin Mary. I believe you suffered and died and rose again from the dead. I believe that you pay for all of my sins. I receive you today. I say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown, and I give my life today to you. You are now the master and the commander of my life. You're the boss of my life. You're my father, and I choose from this day to follow you. Spirit of God, give me the strength to walk the path you have towards me. With every head bowed, I was going to ask a quick question. As someone said today, Pastor, I prayed that prayer for the first time. I recommitted my life to Christ, just so I know, so I can help you a little bit better. Anyone else to say, Pastor, it was me today? Just quickly show, show a hand. Just one this morning said, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer this morning. Anyone this morning? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else this morning? Okay. In your bulletin, there is a connection card. All right? Um, this is confidential. We, we know only people, a few people look at these things. I have a special gift for you if you give your life to Christ. You fill this out, give it to uh, one of the, you can get one of those boxes, or afterwards I'm going to ask the um, prayer team to make their way up. We're going to have an opportunity for prayer right now as we, the worship team does this. So I want to ask you to fill this out. We have a special gift for you. We want to help you along the way. And my friends, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We all need Jesus, whether you're starting in the beginning or the past. And so let's all stand if we could and, and have a conclusion. And in your bulletin is also something called Why Christmas? A great opportunity to share with somebody and then build your faith. Go ahead, please. And rescue me. Thou came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. I am forevermore. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high and valley low. I'll sing out in my mind's soul. I am yours. I am forever yours. Amen. God bless you. May the miracle of Christmas, the incarnation of Christ, fill your hearts. We hope to see you on, on, on Wednesday night. If not, we're going to open the altars here. If you need prayer for anything at all, prayers for whatever, we want to just grab the whole together and pray, okay? Otherwise, God bless you.